All right, let's get started again. Our speakers this afternoon are some guy named Sitter and Jonathan Riddle, because um, nobody can spell his name, apparently. Uh, they'll be talking about KDE Neon, and take it away, guys. Yeah. Hello. Um, so KDE is turning 20 years old, isn't that awesome? Um, unfortunately, in the, the processes we employ hasn't, haven't really changed for 20 years. But it's a bit peculiar because the industry has moved on, right? In the industry, DevOps is all the rage. Um, it's a continuous cycle of you code and then you deploy and then you look at what you deployed and then you code some more. But in, in terms of how we release our software, we haven't really adopted this. What we do is we have a release cycle where we do code, then we have the feature freeze, then we release the software as source code. And then we leave it to other people to take this source code and turn it into binaries. And so in a way, it hasn't really changed since David Faure uh, first uploaded kconfig on some FTP server many, many years ago. And Stefan Kuhler would take this source code and turn it into a binary um, for people to actually use. And so John and I, we went to California with a part of the plasma team and we thought it a good idea to go surfing there for no other reason than that. <laughs> um, and, we, it, and it hit us, right? Um, releasing software is a lot like waves, right? It's, there's a release and then there's like this massive wave of stuff that you need to do and it's all very horrible for, from the integration point of view, right? Um, frameworks, as we've heard, is 70 tables or so, who's going to do that all at once, right? Integrating it all at once. Um, it's not practical from, from the integration point of view because you're doing a lot of change at, at all at once. So there's going to be problems, you're going to mess up um, just because of how it's working. And Jonathan is the release manager for Plasma and he also doesn't like it because as a release manager you're sort of you're putting your name on the release, right? You're responsible that this is going to be a good thing. And how can, you, how can you reasonably do this if it is very hard for people to actually try software before it is released? And so we decided to do a thing we call Neon. Now Neon is a cool new way, um, a way, or rather the way we imagine KD software should be done, which is without the strict separation of for creating code, releasing code, and then having someone else, someone unrelated, in fact, other organizations even, integrate the code. And Neon tries to solve this. Neon very much is about getting KDE software to the users, to testers, to developers, as quickly as possible. And so we looked at the playbook that the industry employs in order to do this continuous release cycle thing, and we set up a Jenkins instance, which is now building KDE software continuously in a way that can be installed and used by us, by users, um, by everyone who's interested, really. And it's set up under the KDE umbrella, so every KDE developer can go to uh, build.neon.kde.org and trigger a build, um, if, if you so choose. Um, also, the packaging. So the essentially the, the instructions um, for how do I turn this uh, source code into a binary. Um, it's also hosted on Git repositories that are on the, the KDE umbrella, so every KDE developer can go there and tweak with the packaging, right? And we have a lot of technology in there that prevents things to break for the user. So you can sort of go wild, right? It's going to turn everything red and then you will probably get an angry mail from me. But you can do it, right? That's kind of the point. We are not separating between who's doing the, the application source code and who's doing the integration. Now we started off with frameworks and Plasma um, because clearly those are the, the core products that we're producing um, for Linux. Um, on the one hand, the foundations we build upon the frameworks and Plasma, of course, being the the, the workspace that everyone sh should be using, really, because it is the best workspace, isn't it? Absolutely. <laughs> uh, 
Um, but, and recently we also started doing um, application releases, extra gear, even though extra gear isn't really a thing, so generally all the applications that we have in addition to frameworks um, and Plasma. And it's really cool and it's chucking along nicely and the really cool thing is, and this is sort of a hidden motivation, is packaging and integrating software for the longest of times has been a very manual process. It was David Vaux uploading the tarball, someone else fetching the tarball, building the tarball, the tarball would not build because dependencies were missing, someone goes off, finds the dependencies, builds the dependencies. It is a really messy process and it is cumbersome and awful. And so the hidden motivation in a way is that everything is automated. Like doing a frameworks release for Neon is clicking a button and then machines do their, their stuff and at the end comes out um, a binary that we can install and, and use. Um, the entire thing is driven by something we call Pangea tooling. Pangea tooling is, in the broadest of senses, tooling for CI systems. Um, it does a lot of stuff. It basically sets up Docker images, manages Docker images, life cycles and whatnot. Um, it is a fairly expensive uh, library as well that just does stuff relating to CI. And so it isn't really a surprise that the same tooling is used for uh, a Debian CI Rohan Garg is running, um, which basically does the same thing, but on uh, a Debian core system. And the same technology is being used to, uh, to build the Plasma mobile prototypes we're, we're doing. Um, the entire thing is written in Ruby with some exceptions. There's actually many different languages involved, but the core, I would say, 95% of Ruby. And it's all unit tested and lovely. Uh, in addition to that, we also have um, a, a repository where we host the binaries. Um, now we are using deb as the binary format because we we know debs, we know how they work, we are uh, probably reasonably good at creating them, I would say. And so aptly is the software used for that. Um, the entire thing is being built in the cloud because scalability and whatnot. Um, we distribute files over files.kde.org, the established mirror network we also use for um, source tables for the longest of times. And recently we've got a new uh, Git setup um, that is basically exactly what we have for the source code. It just runs um, separately because basically what Neon needs to do is have for every KDE repository, uh, repository we have, Neon would have a mirror repository with the packaging instructions um, for the re uh, code repository. And importantly, that repository, because we're a KDE project, everyone who's a KDE developer or 1,000 odd people with Git accounts can make fixes directly to it. So it's no more a case where you install it and you go, well, you didn't add that file in the right place. Everybody in KDE can make those fixes directly and then they can build them and then they can test them directly and trivially. And so the whole process becomes a lot more smoother because there isn't an artificial separation between the people making the source code and the people deploying it. Um, and we have to have a way to deploy it and so we have installable ISOs that you can download and install on your computer. And we use the foundation of Ubuntu LTS edition which gets updated every two years. Um, so that's an, a nice stable edition and it's unlike a rolling release setup like Gentoo, it's not going to take ages to update every morning and it's not going to uh, break or yeah, it won't break every morning. But it has enough updates in it that it's still relevant after those two years, it's still perfectly usable. And we deliberately kept it quite a light uh, system that you install by default. The virtual design group picked a few programs which uh, are the best integrated with Plasma. Plasma is KDE's flagship product and we design Neon around Plasma. Uh, so they picked VLC uh, for videos and Firefox and Dolphin and Arc and Gwenview and, and that's about it for default applications because people beyond those basic ones will have their own preferences and they're very welcome to install those. Uh, the main thing that's missing is a PDF uh, reader because Ocular is still uh, KD Libs 4 and we only want uh, support and maintain software and the frameworks branch isn't yet merged. So if there's any Ocular developers, that would be lovely to have done pronto. 
Um, our packages and our ISOs are available in three editions, which mirror the three main uh, use cases of the KDE sources. And the most important one is the user edition, um, because that's the most important results made by KDE. And this uses the tarballs that we release on download.kde.org. Uh, so Debian has a technology called watch files, and those watch files uh, scan download.kde.org. Um, for any new releases and when a new release comes along, uh, our Jenkins continuous integration builds over, kicks into life, and builds them away automatically. Um, and the user edition has various QA checks in terms of uh, checking that it, the release hasn't, isn't a malicious version, it's actually got the right signatures, um, uh, that it successfully compiles, successfully installs, doesn't uh, break the previous stuff in previous ways. Um, and it's intended for people who are fans of KDE Plasma or who are interested and have heard about this awesome software that KDE creates and who want to know the best way to get hold of it. But the other two editions uh, are the developer editions. And one is built from the Git stable branches uh, from which releases are made. And one is made from the Git unstable branches, the master branches. And that's intended for people who want to be active contributors, who are either coders like many of the people here or who have found a bug maybe in the user edition. Maybe they've reported a bug, but the developer says, well, uh, there's no use to me that that stuff is last year, last month's code, and need a way to get the latest stuff. And this is a good answer to um, the KD developers can give to people of how you get the latest and how you test your fixes. Go on. Is that a question? Yeah. Go with the question. Um, well, actually, the first one is not a question. Um, I started using the Git Unstable uh, builds also for confirming um, fixes for problems. So a user would uh, come on Baxilla, um, I'm running the latest stable, I have this and that problem. Um, I would go, yeah, we did a whole bunch of changes. Could you test the Git Unstable uh, image in the live CD? So um, no harm, just takes a bit of time. Um, two days later, we've fixed something and I can hit the rebuild button and ask the user um, pretty much the next day, could, can you confirm this is fixed? That's extremely valuable to me because I don't um, have to wait until, well, basically months until um, updates hit the user so I can actually get confirmed that I fixed the bug, but um, I can even fix the bug that I introduced with my fix before it hits, it, it hits release. Um, the other thing is, um, was it the plan that for before 5.9 is released that we create an additional user edition with the Plasma 5.8 LTS? Yes, so with 5.8 being an LTS release, um, we have the intention of having uh, another edition, which would be the LTS edition and tracking 5.8. Uh, so Kitty has often shipped software directly to users before. That's not particularly new. Critter puts their code in in the Steam store. Uh, Plasma Active had a reference release back in the day, uh, which people could install to test from the Plasma Active developers to say this is what it should be looking and feeling like. Jay Compri uh, puts their source code in, in the Android store, in Google Play store. Um, and Plasma Mobile shipped images as well from, from when that was launched last year. But what's new is continuous delivery is that um, the, the software is updated as soon as, as soon as it's either coded for the unstable edition or as soon as the developers say this is good for release for the stable edition. And KDE as a project exists because of the internet and the internet allows this. So it's strange that KDE hasn't embraced continuous delivery until now that uh, we've had this very slow, chunky model. And having a model where users just can automatically get the latest stuff on their system um, is something which is quite novel, but also something which we should be ideally placed to uh, take part in. Uh, much of the work for uh, that came in, that became uh, the KD Neon and the Pangea tools, uh, started with Plasma Mobile um, because that was a system that needed to be uh, delivered directly into the hands of users. Just having the source code wasn't anybody any use to anybody. Uh, so a lot of that continuous integration stuff with Jenkins um, is what has become what we now use to build KDE Neon. Um, and it's 
now flipped over because K uh, Plasma Mobile is based on um, is based on KDE Neon now. And uh, in the free software world, you're nobody if if somebody isn't using your source code or somebody isn't using your project to create a new project. Um, and in our case, we now have not just Plasma Mobile, but also Maui, Maui Linux as another Linux distribution that has taken KDE Neon, um, decided that's a good base uh, to make their project on. And so they, they come with a far more uh, fleshed out version, default install, that people can try. And there's a big use case for that kind of stuff. Uh, we have a shiny, responsive HTML5 happy website. Again, KDE has been pretty slow at um, picking up the new technologies um, that have happened in the web in the last few years. The website looks pretty slow, so we got Ken Vermatz, who very kindly made this uh, pretty design for us. And um, it works very nice, and there's a hope that it, the same design will be used on the main KDE website. So if anybody wants to pick that up, that's very welcome to do. And, and social media is something else that KDE was always quite slow at picking up. Um, it's the main way that people want to use the internet these days, the main way people get their news and communicate with people. And KDE has been a bit slow at um, having, making good use of that. And this, this still isn't a very good strategy for it. Um, and there's still details that I think should be fixed, uh, fixed and sort of tidied up, like the sysadmins don't have access to the social media accounts, so if something disappears, then what happens to them? But with Neon, we were keen to make sure that the news, it, it wasn't some other new news feed that we were set up, we would just put it on Facebook and Google Plus and Twitter, because that's where people expect news to be on. And, uh, and with the user support forums, again, they're on the pre-existing forums. And as a KDE project, we can use the KDE forums, because that's where people expect it to be. Is that a question at the back? Uh, so I assume as a diaspora user, I'm uh, not, I don't know, welcome or something? Uh, diaspora, is that? Yeah. I know nothing about diaspora, and so that's why I happen not to have put it on, but I would love to be educated and informed and um, to add that to our collection. Uh, this slide is meaning that I spent a lot of time in the last uh, 15 odd years that I've worked with KDE, making sure that uh, every, that the source code is free and that it complies properly with all the correct procedures and whatnot. Um, and so typically that's meant removing things like RFCs, which aren't quite under the free definition, um, or removing PDF files, for example, because PDFs aren't modifiable, but people think that they're free because they make them themselves. Um, and, and these days, that means uh, removing minified JavaScript, because people think minified JavaScript is source code. But of course, it's not modifiable, so it's not source code. So one thing with one of the checks that KDE Neon does is making sure that, um, that everything is uh, free software as far as can be automated, uh, that testing can be automated. And so now we, I can fix that, or I can tell the maintainer to fix that before we release the source code in a slightly non-free style. Um, but as a word of warning, word of interest, well, when new distribution methods come along, we have to make sure those are compliant with the free software norms. So with Neon, we make ISOs, and that means you also have to have source code ISOs, which is quite a big burden, but an important part that we do that. But with um, app images and Flatpak and other containerized applications, we have to work out what's the best way to make sure the source code is available to people. Um, and there's been violations already by uh, ARC, the, the package archiver, um, that have to be tidied up to make sure that source code is available and, and best practices there are still evolving and we need to work those out. <coughs> Something that Kitty has always lacked is an image writer, a way to put an ISO image onto a USB disk as the main way to install our, our software as the Kickstarter to get it onto your computer as the operating system. Uh, we looked around for the best one to use, and Rosa Image Writer, which is made by a Russian project, um, is a very nice one. It's made with Qt and it's cross-platform, which is really important. It's no use just having one that works on Linux if, if our target is to get people to convert from Windows. So that's nicely cross-platform, but it has a few problems. Um, you have to run it as root and so forth. So I'm pleased to say that I've now managed to get the maintainer to turn it into a KDE project, and we have a Git repository for it and uh, we'll be working on making sure that becomes a proper KDE project uh, with, 
with problem solved, like using pockets instead of roots and checksum checking and so forth. One of the side projects that we've done as part of Neon, or actually it started long before Neon, was I made Plasma Wayland images, so ISOs that will run Martin's beautiful work of Quinn running as, as the Wayland. Um, and this is Betty the Fuzzy Pig, which was on the release announcement for Plasma. Nobody commented, which I think is, is slightly disappointing, or, or I'm not sure. Uh, but I think she should be our mascot for Plasma Wayland. And, and as you see, she's a keen, keen user of Plasma Wayland because she can, using these Plasma Wayland ISOs, which are now made through the, the Neon um, platform, and, and so they're pretty trivial to just turn those out every couple of weeks. So, uh, install tracking is something that we talk about occasionally at, at, um, at Academy, and Dan said in the previous talk that he wanted to find out what people use um, with PIM, and again with Neon, we want to find out, does anybody use this stuff? Um, where are they, who are they, uh, what do they use it for? And so I put an ID tag in the updater, and that means that we have web logs, and we can work out how many installs there are, um, and what editions they use. So as a question to the audience, who can guess of the three editions, which ones are the most popular, and in what order? So you've got the two developer editions and the user edition. Which one is the most popular? Dev Unstable. Dev Unstable. Yep. Any other suggestions? Dev Unstable. We De Dev Unstable. Dev Unstable is the most popular with you. Well, big surprise then, because it's the user edition is by far the most popular. It's got um, it's got three times what the other editions have, uh, which is not no big surprise to me, but maybe a big surprise to you. Um, and next down is Dev Stable and Dev and then dev unstable. And this slightly tells me that maybe our messaging is actually a bit incorrect because people, I think, will be installing dev stable because they think that's, that's the crack of the day, but it's, but it's a bit more stable than that one. And in reality, our use cases should be, well, this is, this is still crack of the day, and it can still contain new bugs that haven't been tested. And if you're using this, chances are you want to be a tester who is able to give some feedback and report bugs. Is that a question? Uh, I've taken out the numbers here because we're not sure, because people can remove uh, the install tracking and so it doesn't have any particular absolute meaning, um, but it's not many. It's about a thousand, so it's not like, it's not like we're taking over the world with this, um, yeah. but it, it's an interesting, useful uh, way to start the project, I think. So the next question is, what are the top three countries that use KDE Plasma as defined by Neon? Who, who knows what would be the top three countries? Germany. Germany. Many Germans here? Okay, number one, and what, what else would be in the top three? Brazil. Sorry? Brazil. Brazil? Yeah. USA. USA, somebody says, yeah. They did some things on the Say again? Macedonia. Macedonia. Ah, oh, Macedonia, but probably not with Neon, so I guess it wouldn't be counted here. So not Macedonia, but but it is. This one is Germany over here, so well done. <laughs> Absolutely right. And then, but then number two is the United States, which was said, so it's maybe no immediate surprise, but what's interesting to note is that there's not a massive difference between the popularity in Germany and the popularity in the United States, but the number of Germans who are at this conference, the number of Americans who are at this conference is, is, mostly, is mostly like two Americans and, and vast numbers of Germans. So that tells me that we're missing out on potential members of the KDE community uh, who are using our software but somehow have not been brought into the community. So how can we make KDE great again? How can we make KDE great again? Stop using pre-grated pre cheese. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then number three is Latvia, and, and who's from Latvia? There's a mysterious KDE community there, I'm not sure. Okay, let's move on, we're running out of time. Yeah. Um, so as part of uh, being responsible for the source code, as well as the integration side, um, what we started to look at is um, security and authenticity of, of our stuff, right? Um, only recently 
uh, Linux Mint got uh, their installation ISA compromised and had malicious code in there. And so what we started doing is doing a full signing chain, which is what this means is that the release script for Plasma right now will sign the Git tags it creates as well as the tables it creates. Um, this is then uploaded to the source servers. We fetch them, we verify that those are signed by keys we know and trust. We then build them, sign them again when they come out as the ISO with our uh, specific ISO signing key. And so we have a full chain of, uh, of authenticity and we, can, we, know, we, we are very sh certain that, that it's the software that we, we expect it to be. And uh, I know that OpenSUSE is already doing this as well and I, I hope that other distros will start doing it as well. Um, but there's still a, a long way to go. Frameworks and applications currently aren't signed. Um, <laughs> we, we, yeah, we tried to figure it out, but uh, we definitely need to do something um, uh, because it is, it is very important and we have ignored this for a very long time and we shouldn't any longer. Um, of course, in the future, um, as uh, Jonathan mentioned, containers are, of course, uh, a very interesting and hot topic right now. So uh, I took a bunch of KDE people and took to a Snappy Sprint. Uh, Snappy is one of the container formats that are being considered. And we uh, basically just made our requirements known and discussed the technology as a whole and what we expect to happen. And uh, I should hope that we as KDE are very much at the frontier with regards to containerization, regardless of the, the format. And we do have a foot in the door of Snappy. Because of Neon, we can very cheaply create Snappy packages. And essentially during uh, the Snappy sprint rec recently, uh, we basically uh, exposed all our applications also as snaps, which you can install right now and run right now if you know where to find them. <laughs> so they're not tested. There are a lot of uh, uh, things that we need to still figure out in order to, to be able to ship them into production, but uh, we are very much uh, on the right way there. And with that, we've come to questions. If you're bored during questions, you can read that, uh, which is the explanation of why Neon is called Neon. So, questions? More questions? Now everyone's busy reading. <laughs> fairly disappointing. That's what happens when you write long bedtime stories. Are one of you going to host a key signing boff so that... Oh yeah, so I'm, I'm going to look into doing a key signing boff tomorrow or sometime during the week. Um, it would very much improve, um, so yeah, yes. You mentioned user tracking, what are you doing there and why? Well, when you, Neon will ask for when, when is the latest update, and so I made it add the machine ID to, to the URL for that, so in the web logs we can look at the machine ID, um, and we get a pretty decent idea of how many users are installed as part of the ongoing to-do work is making it trivial to remove that for people who don't want to have their machines tracked. Um, and people are, are told about that when they, when they download about Neon, but um, yeah, but I'd be interested in more feedback about how to make that more, more friendly to people who don't want to be tracked. Um, and what are we doing with it? Well, just the two graphs that I showed you there for now. Um, and I'd be interested in knowing from people what what other graphs they would be interested in that we could make with this data and see if we could get more interesting information on what, who our users are and therefore who we're missing or where the potentials are that we need to work harder. Also, it's a pretty good camera regard. If we screw up, yes. at least one sign we, we can see it. Yeah. All right, any other questions? Then let us thank the speakers.